Hello, um, thanks for having me. I thought my talk is in an hour, that's why um, I kept you waiting. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, yeah, my, 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 my watch is still in, the, in Berlin, um, apparently. So, um, yeah, so let's get to it. I'm gonna talk about ZFS directory scaling. So, who am I? Uh, I'm a FreeBSD committer since 2018. You may know me as Zero MP. I am now serving on the FreeBSD core team, and uh, most, of, most days I work on cool stuff with folks at Clara. Uh, but in general, I poke around things like documentation, ports, RC scripts, tracing, and ZFS. And the outline of today's presentation is as follows. First, I'm gonna tell you about ZFS and dive a bit into the implementation details of how it works. Then I'll pivot to directories. Then we talk briefly about scaling and then I'll give you some numbers about, um, well, how the tuning of uh, directories in ZFS uh, can work. So to give you some um, background of this whole work, um, so this is the, the uh, benchmarking we did for a client at Clara. And uh, the orange line is what the default ZFS does. Uh, so when you have many, uh, when you write many files into a directory, into a single directory in ZFS, the performance drops, right, as you can see. Uh, but if you apply some tuning uh, that I'm gonna present to you, you can be where the green line is. Of course, it depends on your setup disks, um, the rest of your tuning, but um, essentially, there is some performance gains that you may try to get out of your system. So, let's talk about ZFS. So, what is it? It's a copy and write file system. Uh, it was developed at Sun in 2001. It was imported into FreeBSD shortly after in 2008. And as of 2023, FreeBSD uses, uses something called OpenZFS, which is um, a variant of fork. There are a couple of different implementations in the wild of ZFS and um, OpenZFS works on both Linux and FreeBSD. Uh, this allows for more, more cross-pollination of ideas, more testing. This is a pretty cool initiative. Um, so what does ZFS do? So there are a couple of things. The most important ones are um, maybe data integrity. So every block you have on your system is checksumed, which is nice. And um, when data gets corrupted, um, ZFS can detect it, and if it's not too much of a corruption, it can also try to correct it. Or at least report to you that, hey, something is wrong, you should really take a look at those disks. Um, it also offers data consistency. So even if your system crashes, you won't end up with a disk that is in, in, in an inconsistent state. Um, um, whenever you write to a disk in ZFS, your data is kind of saved on the side and waits for the checkpoint to come. And when the che checkpoint arrives, um, all your writes, they are made official and now they are the new you know, version of, of the state, like of what's happening on the disk. So you never have an inconsistency there. And also there is pooled storage. So there is no need to partition disks, disks in advance. You just give all your storage you have to ZFS and then you can create partitions, grow them, shrink them. Um, you don't have to think in advance about how you wanna split the, the storage you have in between different partitions. Um, apart from that, it does many other things like snapshots, efficient remote replication, compression, encryption, deduplication, all kinds of cool stuff, uh, which are, um, well, it can do all those cool things because of the way how it's structured. So we could get many features out of the, um, well, the implementation. Which I'm gonna tell you about. Um, so I would like to give you like a short um, introduction to what happens when you write data to ZFS. Um, right, so what we have here, we have Uber blocks at the very top. This is like the the root node of this whole tree that ZFS consists of. And um, at any given point, you have one Uber block that is like an active one, and it points down to like this whole tree that is all the data you store um, in ZFS. Um, so in this case, we have the Uber block, it points to like many, many disks, it's like the first, like, like let's, let, let's say for, for simplicity, like to a pool and then to a data set and then some directory maybe, and then we end up at this uh, profile, 
uh, .profile file, uh, which then has some indirect blocks, and then we have the actual content, uh, the data blocks, which is in this case like one of them, let's say, contains editor equals vi, then the other block contains, contains pager equals less, right? This is like the actual data stored there. So what happens when you write, when, when you want to replace your editor vi with editor ed, because vi is too complex and you want something simple? Um, what happens is that you issue a write, and ZFS allocates, it, like it copies the block, it modifies it the way you want, and it saves it on a site. And then um, the whole tree, uh, all the parents are updated because now we have a new block. So the, the block above, uh, it needs to, well, have a new checksum because the content below changed. So, so you go up and then, oh, we have to go up again. And then you have to copy the profile because, you know, um, the checksums and, and things. And as you go up um, and you prepare all those new blocks, what happens later is that when there's a checkpoint, you start pointing to the new block that you just created in this writing period, and the new Uber block gets, um, well, activated. So from now on, you have a new tree with all the updated data. That's how we uh, avoid inconsistencies, right? Because first, we write everything we need in this new um, checkpoint, right? And then once we're ready, we just switch the, the, the root node, which is the Uber block, and we're good. So what is a file in ZFS? Um, it is an object. And an object is just a group of blocks that is organized at the top by a D node, which is something like an I node uh, in, in UFS. Um, yes. And um, almost everything is an object in ZFS, files, directories, data sets. In this case, when you, when you look at the file object, you have, well, the file object, the red uh, frame, the yellow frame is a denote, so it's the, this is like the, the root of this subtree. And one of the things it points at is the block tree where the actual data is stored. Sometimes you cannot, um, sometimes it's like not, like apart from the direct blocks where the actual data is stored, you also need indirect blocks which help you address more than um, uh, just a bit of data, right? You just need to build this tree a bit, uh, like it has to be a bigger tree to store more data. So those are the parts of a file object that you uh, that we would like to um, talk about today. So let's take a closer look at the files. So what you can do in ZFS, you can inspect uh, those objects. So what we do here is uh, we create a half a gigabyte file um, on ZFS, and then we inspect it with ZDB, which is like a debugger for ZFS. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at what's happening in this output. So there are a couple of interesting things. For example, the, 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 the blue uh, highlighted thing, Fletcher 4, this is um, the checksum algorithm, and you can change it to different ones. Different algorithms offer different trade-offs, right? Some of them are faster, some of them are like slower, but something, you have a choice. Depending on your workload, this may improve performance or like change the characteristics of your, your system. The yellow highlight, for example, is uh, the compression. So compression is um, ZFS compresses all the data by default for you, uh, which is nice because then when you read the data from the disk, you have to transfer less bytes. So it makes things faster. And decompressing those things is usually quite fast. Um, but then, of course, depending on your workload, you can either pick um, compression algorithms, algorithms that are um, faster, but they compress wor in a worse way, or you can pick the one that is like very CPU intensive, but then it also compresses very well, right? If you want to save some space on the disk. Um, yeah, and then we move a bit lower, and in, in the green highlights shows us the the block tree, and so it says indirect blocks, and then L2, this is like level two uh, indirect block, and then we have some level one indirect blocks, L1, and then we have L0, those are the direct blocks. This is where the actual um, contents of our file is. Um, yeah, and in, in each of those entries, you can, you can see the, ad uh, the address and maybe the, the size, the checksum, 
um, it's, it's pretty cool to, the, the, the ZDB tool, it's, it's a nice uh, tool to, to know about and uh, to, to know how, to, how it operates if you wanna explore ZFS a bit more. For example, um, we have in, in BSDs, we have this wonderful file called flowers. If you don't know about it, you really should. It's very useful. Um, so what we're gonna do, we, um, just for the experimentation, we set the record size to um, 512 bytes, so not too much. Um, and then we copy the flowers file into the data set. So now when we inspect it with, the Z with ZDB, we um, take a look at the output, and we can see that we allocated exactly three data blocks, which is what we expected, because if you look at the output of LS at the top, this file is um, one and a half kilobytes. So three blocks of 512 bytes should be enough to, to store it. So that's cool. So let's, what we can do now, we can use ZDB to extract the contents of this file to take a look. So we use awk to like uh, parse out the exact address and now we use ZDB again with minus R. We tell it, hey, on this pool called tang, there is this address. So give the contents of this block to me. And as you can see, we get the same output from Z ZDB as we get from head, um, which is nice, right? What we did here, the, the addresses and copying and so on, it works. You can feel that you have a bit more control over what ZFS does. Um, yeah, these and, and much more you can do with ZDB and like explore a bit what's going on there. So, directory. Um, so from our wonderful manual pages, um, we can learn that directories provide a convenient hierarchical method of grouping files while obscuring the underlying details of the storage medium. And a directory consists of records, directory entries, each of which contains information about the file and a pointer to the file itself. So a directory is basically a map of file names to some identifier. So let's take a look how it's, um, how it's done. We can do a couple of different operations to the directory. Um, today we're gonna focus on path name searching, so lookups and name creation. I won't be talking about the performance of all the other uh, operations. It's out of the scope for today. Um, what is the directory in ZFS? It is an object, just like a file. The difference is that it has a different tree. It's not a, it's not a tree of um, data blocks, it's a tree of zap blocks. Um, but then what is a zap, right? So a zap is a ZFS attribute processor. So it's a key value store, it's a map. And the keys can be strings, and the values can be strings, numbers, arrays of numbers, different things, it's very flexible. It's used primarily, pri primarily for directories, but it's not the only place where it's used in the code base. Um, it's implemented as an extensible hash table, and it's case nicely up to hundreds of millions of entries in a single directory. It's, it's, it's a good data structure. It's slightly complicated, but it's a good one. Um, it's also called a fat zap because there is also a, a micro zap, which is um, a much smaller data structure designed to remove some of the overhead of this complicated data structure for smaller directories. So um, a micro zap is just a single block and it stores the mapping of file names to, well, um, to objects. So you cannot really store like complicated things there. It's, it's just, you know, strings to some IDs. It can only hold uh, a maximum of 2,047 entries by default. And the uh, keys are limited to 50 bytes. So if your file names are longer, you won't be able to use a micro zap. Um, and values are limited to integers, but that's obvious. And a micro zap gets automatically promoted to fat zap. So whenever you um, create the 2048th file in your directory, ZFS will um, change the micro zap into fat zap for you and start using this whole complicated data structure, right? Because like it's, it's getting ready to handle a lot of files. 
Um, the same thing is going to happen if you have a long file name. Um, one of the problems is that if you make a mistake in your home directory, for example, and by some accident you have a script that creates like temporary files and you end up creating a million like temporary files in, in your home directory, um, the DFS will gladly do it and it will work. Then you can remove all those files, but, but the fat zap is going to stay there. So from now on, whenever you run ls, ZFS will have to traverse all this like extensive fat zap that you just created. And in order to get rid of that, you, would, you, you will have to, um, well, recreate the directory basically, which is not exactly something uh, that you want to do with your home directory. Um, it's, it's a known uh, limitation, let's say, and it's, uh, been, people work on it. If you want to check out the, pro pro the progress on the, on the patch that is in flight now, um, you can look for OpenZFS issue number 14088. So, scaling. Um, this is going to be like a very uh, high level introduction to what you can do to ZFS. So there are a couple of different ways how you can change how ZFS behaves. The first one is you, you set uh, properties um, on data sets. The other one, ZFS, with ZFS create, you can also set those properties during the creation of a data set. Some of the properties can also be changed with CCTL and then depending on what property it is, it influences the whole ZFS module that runs on your machine or, it, or like specific pools or data sets. Um, for some of the tunables, you have to set them before loading the module and then you do it with a loader, for example. So there are many different places. Sometimes you can get a bit confused where you can do it, um, but in general, the documentation is quite good. Some of the popular tunables that people set or like start with when they're trying to uh, tune ZFS is our A time, which is access time. Um, this is on by default, so whenever you access a file, it also gets, um, well, the A time gets updated, so ZFS has to write in a, a new block where the A time is, you know, a new one. Um, this can impose a lot of overhead, and if your application doesn't depend on A time, it's a good idea to uh, turn it off. Um, the record size, um, so this one is a very, um, how should I say, popular problem uh, in when people deploy ZFS because their application is uh, writing in like different chunks in different sizes than, than ZFS is, is storing data and this mismatch creates performance problems. Um, well, usually because ZFS has to do more work than it sh should be doing. Um, so it's good to align it with your workload. Another one that is primary cache, you can change what you, what you really want to cache in ZFS. You can um, either store like data and metadata inside or just metadata. This makes sense, for example, when your application does uh, its own caching so that you don't cache data twice. And then things like compression, right? If, if you want to, to um, have this trade-off of um, spending more CPU time but then having data more compressed to gain more storage, you can also do it with the compression uh, uh, tunable. And now we'll switch to something more specific to directories. So this is the first of, of, of two tunables I'm gonna talk about. Uh, it's, um, it's a way to control the maximum size of a micro zap. And it's this, this CTL is called VFS ZFS zap micro max size. Um, the idea is that at the moment, the default is um, for, for a micro zap is to be one of, of the size of 128 kilobytes. And that's where those 2047 entries fit. If you want to store more, so we want, uh, so we want to delay the moment when the micro zap turns into a fat zap, you can, uh, well, increase, the, increase this uh, maximum size of a micro zap, for example, to one megabyte, and then you can store up to 60, like slightly over 16,000 files in this single block. It was uh, made um, a tunable fairly recently, earlier this year. And to give you some ideas, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a larger micro zap? So 
um, when it's larger, directory object has to, has to um, well, it has less direct blocks, right? So when you're reading, you don't have to read this whole tree of fat zaps. You just fetch this one block and you're good because now you know the whole structure of a directory. Um, on the other hand, when you are writing to a directory, you no longer update, um, you know, smaller blocks. You update this one huge block. So if you write to your directory often, this can lead to an overhead. They're like always trade-offs. Uh, the other um, ZFS um, directory tuning thing is a size of indirect blocks. It can be controlled with VFS, ZFS, default IBS. The default is 17, which is two to the power of 17, which is 128 kilobytes. Um, it's available on FreeBSD since a long time, but then um, it was also made um, a tunable revolution free on Linux. And the advantages of having smaller indirect blocks is that um, you have to uh, process less bytes when you're reading or writing, right? But on the other hand, you may end up with a larger tree that you have to traverse. So again, trade-offs. So let's see how those tunables behave when you actually use them and run some benchmarks. Yeah, let's talk about some numbers. I um, prepared two benchmarks for you today. Um, one is a lookup benchmark when we, when we just um, recursively traverse through the directories and we just uh, process every entry that is there. And another one is create. So we create a lot of empty files just to update the directory structures and see how it's, um, how fast it gets. I used Hyperfine as my benchmarking harness. It's a pretty cool um, piece of software. Um, if you don't know it, it's, it's, it's very nice for uh, ad hoc experimentation. Um, yeah, and the tunables, you already know, those are the ones I introduced in the previous slides. So benchmark one, lookup. So the measuring, what we're measuring? We're measuring the time to list files of all subdirectories. I'm just using like a very short C program that does FTW. And we're gonna focus on three parameters here. Um, the files per subdirectory, the maximum micro zap size, and then indirect block size. So um, this is what happens when you um, have 16 thousand files in directories. So this number exceeds the, the default uh, micro zap size, but it's just before the, it, it, it fits nicely into this one megabyte um, micro zap before the fat zap kicks in. So as you can see here, uh, larger micro zaps increase performance um, because we could stick to the micro zap for longer. So, um, retrieving, like re reading out this directive structure was only one, one block and not many. That's probably why we see the difference. The indirect block size doesn't really matter here, or at least not in this particular deployment. And then we test six, 64,000 files. So we definitely exceed the limitations of both the default micro zap and the, and the tuned micro zap. And as you can see, there are no differences in performance pretty much. It's, it's, it's just noise. Um, so once the fat zaps kick in, um, you don't really see the difference. So one of the um, takeaways from this one is that if you want to tune it to your workload, you should really think how many files you're gonna store in your directories. There is no one silver bullet to just make everything faster every time it has to be really adjusted to your own workload and your system. Um, right, and then um, let's take a look at one more example of, of, of uh, the lookup benchmark. So here we have 16,500 files. So we exceed both micro zaps. The bigger one was like, just exceeded like 200 files ago. But we turn primary cache off. So we are not caching anything. 
which results in um, the indirect block size uh, being very relevant in this, in this, in this uh, situation. The microservice size does not really matter anymore um, from what we see, but the, <coughs> but the performance of, of recovering smaller block, blocks from the disk, it really makes a difference. So as you see, depending on the workload again or um, how your system is designed and how much memory it uses, different tunables can do different things. They can have, they can have a different effect on your system. Benchmark two. So we're gonna look at the writing case for directories. So what I'm doing here, I'm, I time, um, I, I measure the time to create files in directory. So what I do, I just open a, a file. So now I have an, an, an empty file and I sync it so that it gets uh, sent to the disk. And again, the parameters are the same. So let's jump to, to the result. Um, over here, um, I'm running the benchmark with uh, 247 files. So it fits both the default micro zap and the large one. And there is no observable difference yet. That's probably because the system is too fast or something um, so that we, we can't really notice. Um, let's go further. When we have 16,838 files, so we exceed the default one, but it fits into the, uh, the, the tuned one just barely, um, we already see some differences. So larger micro zaps are more expensive in writing because we overwrite them way more and they are heavier. They, they, we need to write more bytes, right? So it's slower. Um, so this can be pretty disastrous for your performance because now it's twice slower than it used to be. So yeah, measure your system before you tune. However, uh, when we increase the number of files to 64,000, the, the performance gap uh, starts to shrink. So there is less and less, uh, like the, the, the difference is shrinking basically, right? So um, that's a good thing. So again, measure your systems. So the summary. There are two important tunables for directory scaling. Uh, the maximum micro zap size and the indirect block size. And the tuning takeaways are reads are faster with larger micro zaps and smaller indirect blocks. And writes may slow down when using larger micro zaps. And as I said many times, tuning depends on the system. So you should really measure the system before tuning it. But basically now you know which tunables are relevant to this part of ZFS. So when you decide that, hey, this is like relevant to my systems to tune how fast my directory is working, um, you can use those and see how it plays out. Do you have any questions? Um, so should I repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is if I compared it to UFS. Um, no, I didn't, um, but it's a very interesting, um, but I thought about it. The reason why I didn't do it was that um, it's, it's very tricky to benchmark two different file system against each other, especially since ZFS has so many layers of indirections and caching and so on. So um, I didn't do it because I, I wasn't sure if I can deliver, you know, <laughs> reasonable results <laughs> that we can talk about. Um, yeah? I can imagine how long it would take to match a glob with maybe, let's say, a tenth of the file. So the question is if I measured globbing in a shell so that I'm not um, looking, looking up all the files but like a subset, right? Um, I didn't do it, but then when you're reading out the directory and you would, when you're using globbing, you, you, I guess you, you, you still have to read the whole um, data structure just to see if you're matching anything. So I think that would be the same. Yeah, 
Der muss dann. So the question is uh, if the tunables are data set uh, specific or they influence the whole system. Um, they influence the whole system from what I see. Um, the, yeah, if it was otherwise, we would see at least, you know, some, a part of the syscitia would be a name of the data set or a pool. Ah, yes, yes, of course. I, I wanted for the system to stay, like, b I wanted the directories to really be micro zaps, and I checked that with ZDB after every um, mm -hmm. run. The question is if we can change this, this limitation of micro zaps to not be 50 bytes, but maybe like less or more. There is no tunable that I know of, and I guess that what you can do, you can just patch it out and see if you can fit more directories in there, uh, like entries there. But that's a, like a manual operation, I would assume. Um, so you still have to read out the whole thing. Um, the interesting bit is that when you when you switch from a micro zap to a fat zap, you just add one more block. I mean, you, it, the, the structure of everything changes, but effectively, when you look at the output of ZDB, you have one more block to deal with. Uh, perhaps that answers your question. It's. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of how much composition it would make to have the additional layer of indirection in the file system as a whole, like data, or is it to list all of the blocks in a giant directory map? Mm, so is the question, does it help to have subdirectories, or? Yeah, does it help uh, to have the, the, the directory files to fit into a micro map and nest them, or is it better to have Oh yeah, system? nesting is very helpful. If you, if you can change your workload to um, nest directories instead of fitting all the files into one directory, this is one of the ways to make it fast. I mean, then of course you have to do more lookups, right? Because you have to traverse the whole uh, hierarchy. But it's, um, from what I saw, this is usually the better idea. Mm -hmm. Yes? So the question is if ZFS has uh, a special cache for names. No, for uh, names in binary. Ah, for, for the name, yeah. like the name cache. Has a name cache. I don't I remember. Know. I'm not sure if I ever knew. <laughs> So the question is if I, if I have, um, uh, if I measure the, the number of I.O. operations um, that were issued during the benchmarks, I didn't measure it. I just wanted to have, I mean, I did it when I was doing the work for the client. I didn't do it for, for, for this like presentation of um, the general, I in general intuitions of how to work with those uh, tunables. But if you look at the very first, uh, at this graph, this is rise throughput. So, um, I'm not sure how to answer your question. I didn't do it. I don't have any numbers to, I can, I can, I can share with you on that. Um, it could be done. <laughs> Thank you. 